And now for something completely different. Hi, my name is Annie Grossman, and I'm a dog trainer. This podcast is brought to you by School for the Dogs, a Manhattan-based facility I own and operate along with some of the city's finest dog trainers. During this podcast, we'll be answering your questions, geeking out on animal behavior, discussing pet trends, and interviewing industry experts. Welcome to School for the Dogs podcast. Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in. Today's topic is loose leash walking. Now, I'm going to talk about how to walk a dog, like how you should be walking and what equipment you can use. I want to talk about um, what behaviors you're going to reward and where you're going to reward. And then I'm going to um, give you one or two exercises that you can work on when you're trying to um, practice your dog's loose leash walking. Um, but first I want to talk for a minute about what you want your dog to look like on leash or what do you want your walks to look like on leash? What do you want to look like with your dog on leash? Uh, take a moment to conjure up sort of the perfect image of what a walk should be. And I don't think there is really a right or a wrong answer. I just want you to think about what you want your walks to look like so you can work towards that goal. I mention this because there is a man in my neighborhood who for years I've seen him walking his dog in this sort of militaristic style. The dog, who's a a big dog, his You know, his neck probably is close to the guy's hip. Uh, And this guy holds the leash super tightly. There's maybe one foot of leash between his hand and the dog's neck. Or I think maybe he walks him on some kind of like head harness. Anyway, they just look so tense, both of them that they stress me out every time I see them. I want to like give both of them a massage. Anyway, one time I was sitting in the park with my dog on a bench and this guy uh, came and sat down on a park bench near me with his dog and we started chatting a little bit and uh, I couldn't resist saying something. I was nice about it, but I said something like, wow, I noticed your dog walks really close to you or something like that. It, It wasn't Uh, super judgy and he said something like well that's how a dog is supposed to walk outside time isn't about fooling around so fair enough but that's not my idea of how my dog is supposed to walk my vision of the perfect walk if I were to paint a watercolor of it would be my dog walking near me with a very loose leash ideally no tension on the leash Uh, and I want us to kind of be paying attention, paying attention to each other's needs. So, um, if I need to go in one direction, I want him to be aware of that and go in that direction with me. If he needs to stop and pee or poop, I want to be tuned in enough where I'm going to stop too. And if he wants to do something that's not as necessary as peeing and pooping, if he just wants to sniff around check his pee mail as we call it um i want to give him the chance to do that because i think that's a really important part of being on a walk and it's not so important to me that the two of us be walking in some sort of lockstep i also want to make sure he's checking in with me a lot you know i'm the i'm the grown-up on the walk after all i'm the one in charge of keeping us both safe But it's possible to teach a dog to pay close attention to you when you're outside without having a a taut leash. Actually, it's possible to have your dog paying great attention to you on your entire walk without having a leash on your dog at all. Now, I'm not recommending that you walk your dog without a leash, but I think you should be able to if you really had to or you could. About five years ago, I survived a huge apartment fire. There was just some sort of electrical uh, 
I don't know, problem <laughs> inside of one of the walls in my apartment. I live in a very old building and uh, I literally had to run out of my apartment with basically just my cat, my dog, my jacket and my wallet. And uh, fortunately no one was hurt. Um, my other neighbors got out, but one of my neighbors, my upstairs neighbor, had to be carried out by the fireman because she didn't get out fast enough, and she also had a dog, and the dog was also carried out, and she had to go to the hospital because of, uh, smoke inhalation, and before they put her in the ambulance, she handed me her dog, and, uh, I ended up staying at my neighbor's across the street on their couch with my dog, her dog, and my cat, And in the morning, uh, when I went to go walk my dog and her dog, I realized I only had one leash. I had my dog's leash and not her leash because the fireman had carried her out of the apartment. So I put the one leash I had on Daisy, my neighbor's dog was a little corgi, and, um, and I walked her and my dog around the block with my dog off leash which was really no problem. He stayed right near me. Um, he, like I said, he, he is good at walking close to me even without a leash, but lo and behold, someone on the street saw me with this one dog unleashed and just let me have it. Oh my God, she was livid. How, you know, how dare I be so irresponsible as to walk my dog without a leash? And I think I just kind of stared at her dumbfounded. I I didn't have it in me to explain to her that I had just run out of a burning building and (laughs) my neighbor's dog's leash had uh, gone up in flames. All of that is to say that if uh, you have a huge apartment fire and you find yourself outside without a leash, I would hope that you wouldn't panic because you should have a dog who knows to walk right near you and uh, to check in with you often in case you need to get your dog's attention. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about equipment, but I, I first wanted to talk a little bit about how we should think about walking dogs because I think people tend to rely too heavily on equipment. Um, frequently, we have people come into our shop at School for the Dogs and say, you know, what's the best leash for walking my dog? And as if it's like the leash that contains magical properties that will help your dog walk well. And my feeling is you want a leash that's as close to dental floss as possible. I like a thin, lightweight, but sturdy leash. And for some reason, um, it's typical to think, you know, for a big dog, you need a thick, big leash. And for a little dog, you need a thin, little leash. I think you should go as thin as possible always. Um, If you have a a sturdy, thin nylon leash, you'd have to really be walking an elephant of a dog pulling you like crazy in order to break it. And uh, the reason I want a leash that is lightweight is because I want to feel it as little as possible and I want my dog to feel it as little as possible. Again, um, I'm going to give you some, some tips to teach your dog to want to walk near you Uh, so that you're not having to control your dog with the leash. The leash should really be there just in case of an emergency. Of course, you have to have your dog on a leash in most places. It's certainly most urban places, but the goal is not to be using the leash. Kind of like you have to wear a seatbelt, but that doesn't mean that you drive like a maniac. I also like hands-free leashes or leashes that you can... Uh, clip to your treat pouch with a really sturdy carabiner or better yet wrap around your waist. I even have some clients who have very long leashes that they kind of throw over a shoulder and wear like a cross body bag. Hands-free leashes are, well, they're, they're freeing. Uh, I find when I have uh, both hands free, it's so much easier to deliver treats. And it's just really nice to have uh, two hands free. Um, I also think it can help with walking because it can really establish a fixed distance so your dog knows sort of what his or her radius is, whereas if you have a leash in your hand, the radius is going to change based on where your arm is moving. Um, So that's another reason why I like having a a waist leash. My favorite hands-free leash uh, with my dog is the Found My Animal 
nylon leash. I like to use the thin one. Like I said, I like thin leashes. Um, it has these movable rings on it that you can use to adjust the way that you're clipping it. They make a cotton version of this leash and a nylon version. I definitely prefer the nylon version. And um, you don't have to wear it as a hands-free leash. You can certainly hold the, the end in your hand. I also really like the Mendota braided leashes. Those are not long enough to tie around your waist, but um, those are very sturdy, lightweight nylon leashes that are soft in your hand and have a, uh, a nice clip that's um, a sturdy and safe clip at the end, but it's not super heavy. I actually had a client once whose dog refused to walk with her and the dog would only walk with her boyfriend and she had had two or three trainers, I think, come and try and work with this dog to figure out the issue. And uh, I noticed that she and her boyfriend didn't walk the dog on the same leash. They both used different leashes and the leash that the boyfriend had had a much uh, a much more lightweight clasp at the end. The leash that the girlfriend was using had a very uh, heavy clasp at the end and it was banging the poor dog in the face as he was walking. So I had this very Sherlock Holmes moment of, aha, it is not the boyfriend that the dog prefers. It is the leash. Um, and I think definitely dogs can be disturbed by like thick clasps uh, when they're banging in the dog's face. So watch for that when you're picking a clasp. I also tend to prefer trigger clasps, which are um, clasps that sort of overlap on each other. The metal parts overlap on each other. Um, whereas like your typical sort of lobster clasp style uh, leash connection um, can just open up a little bit more easily and I find they are usually a little bit heavier. Now once you pick out a leash you're probably going to want to figure out what you're going to attach the leash to. You know I just walk my dog on a flat collar because again we use the leash like one would use a seatbelt. Uh, I try to not use it very often but of course it's required. I need to attach it somewhere so I attach it to his collar. Um, however, uh, if you have a dog who's pulling at all or you're concerned they're going to pull, um, I do gen generally recommend using a front clip harness. The one that we sell and the one that I like the best is called the Freedom Harness. Uh, it's a front clip style harness that also has a clip on the back between the shoulder blades, which is great because you can choose to clip it on the front. There might be situations where you're fine having your dog way out in front of you, you're hiking or whatever, and you can have the dog clip to his back, um, or you can clip the leash to both. And I'll talk about why you might wanna clip it to both other than safety reasons. But what's nice about a front clip harness is when the leash is, is at their chest like that, the dog simply can't pull very far without being pulled back towards you. If you sort of think about the the location of the attachment in that way, um, when they pull out, they're going to have to pull toward sort of to the side, and that's going to push them back to some extent. Um, dogs also have a lot more weight to pull forward when they're attached at the back between the shoulder baits, where sort of like a typical harness attaches. If you think about it, that's how sled dogs are attached to sleds, right, at their back. And when they start to pull forward and you pull backwards, uh, their natural instinct is going to be to pull against the leash to pull forwards more. So the front clip harnesses kind of counteract that. There are other brands of front clip harnesses. Um, the Easy Walk is a well-known one. The Sensation is another one. Uh, the reason I like the Freedom Harness is because not only does it clip it in the front, but like I said, it has the clip in the back and it also has uh, a piece of uh, like a strap that goes down the middle of the chest, which kind of like keeps the whole thing in place because a lot of times I see people uh, with their dogs in an easy walk and the, the front clip is like all the way over at their shoulder, which is not where it's supposed to be. The other problem with the easy walk is people are always putting it on their dogs upside down. You can tell because the uh, 
there, there's three straps, two of them are the same color and one is a different color and the one that's a different color should be under their armpits. But constantly I see people <laughs> with their dogs wearing it backwards and it's so hard for me as a dog trainer to not go up to the person and correct how they put on their harness. Of course, nobody is particularly um, excited to have a stranger criticize how their dog is wearing their harness. So in general, I do try and refrain. The other nice thing about the Freedom Harnesses is that they have velvet um, in the spot that goes under the dog's armpits, which is nice because um, some dogs, especially dogs like pit bulls who have uh, like really short hair uh, and not so much hair, uh, sometimes get really irritated in that area. So the velvet, the velvet um, helps reduce the likelihood of chafing. Um, also, you might see people with their dogs in head halters, like I was mentioning, uh, the guy in my neighborhood has his dog in. Um, I haven't used those a whole lot. I think they can be useful if you have a dog who's like a garbage eater, because it really does give you a lot more control over their head. It's like kind of like walking a dog more like you would uh, walk a horse. Um, but I think that unless you have someone who's really going to help you use that right, I would avoid it just because I think it can cause neck issues if you use it wrong. Also, dogs tend to not like wearing face harnesses. You can condition them to like wearing it, but if you just put it on and try and go for a walk uh, without doing some training first, very likely you're going to find your dog sort of like uh, pushing his face all around the ground trying to get the thing off, which is counterproductive. Now, once you have your dog all leashed up, harnessed up, you want to think about, of course, where you're going to walk your dog and how you're going to walk your dog. Now, if you have a puppy, keep it short and sweet. Being outside can be very overwhelming for a young dog or any dog who's new to the city for sure, um, but certainly for a puppy. Being on a leash, being in a harness, being in a collar, all of this, you know, we're asking a lot of dogs by taking them outside at all in, uh, in this getup. So keep your walk short and sweet if you have a young dog or a puppy. If you have an older dog who needs to get more energy out and is a little bit more maybe accustomed to being in an urban environment and being on a leash and a harness, uh, you might take a longer walk. I would suggest, however, if you're trying to teach your dog to not pull on the leash, to really pick up the pace. If you are walking fast, your dog is going to be a lot more focused on you. I also think it's a good idea to change directions a lot. This is another way to just help keep your dog's attention. When you're outside, you are a lot less interesting than everything else, right? Because your dog sees you all the time, whereas outside is a never-ending you know, parade of new and exciting things and smells and sounds. So anything you can do to keep yourself the focus of attention, to keep yourself exciting and fun, you want to do. And switching directions, I think, helps your dog be like, oh my God, this woman or man or whoever you are is a really bad driver. I better pay attention to where she's going rather than having your dog just think, you know, we walk forward all the time. I'm out ahead. The other thing is if your dog is in front of you and if your dog is pulling, if you switch directions, now your dog is behind you. So it sort of like resets the game in that way. So walk fast so your dog is focused on keeping up with you rather than the other way around and be unpredictable with your path with, you know, sudden swift changes of direction so your dog is focused on figuring out where you're going rather than figuring out how to get that chicken bone over there into his mouth. So now you've thought about what, your, what you want your walk to look like. You have geared up you have figured out how you are going to walk in order to get the best kind of walking out of your dog. But now what are you going to reward? I mean, you could say you're just going to reward nice leash walking, but I want to be a little bit more specific than that. When you're working on leash walking, you definitely want to have really great food rewards on you. 
Um, because, like I said, you are a lot less interesting than everything else outside. So if you can up your dog's interest in you by creating an association between you and, say, hot dogs, um, I am all for it. So there's a piece of gear I didn't mention when we were talking about gear, which is a treat pouch. Uh, definitely want to have something to hold your treats when you're outside, um, unless you're just really good at holding your treats in your hand while you're walking, which is certainly easier if you have a hands-free leash. Anyway, select something really delicious that you can deliver without too much trouble. Um, I mean, of course, you could also just give your dog uh, his or her meals while you're walking. Certainly, you can deliver kibble one piece at a time as a treat. Um, but if you're just starting out, I would suggest uh, choosing something more delicious than your dog's regular meal, unless your dog is just absolutely psyched all the time about his or her regular meal. Um, I like using licky treats, things that dogs can lick outside, because I find it's easier uh, to deliver that kind of thing while you're walking without getting your hands really gross. Um, we have something we sell called the liquid treat dispenser, which you can, which is just like a little tube, like a travel shampoo tube, basically. Um, but it's one that works really well for this. You can fill it with peanut butter or liverwurst or, oh gosh, I don't know, cream cheese. Um, you can put, um, like, what's that, like orange, what's it called, like spray cheese in it. I have some clients who use like a camping tube that you can fill with your dog's actual wet food. You could use that. Um, there's also products. Uh, there's one called uh, Lean Licks, which are they kind of look like a hard deodorant that your dog can lick. And uh, we also use something called Callus, K-A-L-L-E-S at School for the Dogs. We have it in our shop, which is um, a Swedish cod row. It's like a paste that comes in a tube. Uh, sometimes we'll use that. The dogs can lick that. And I should mention, you don't have to use food. Um, I think for most dogs, food is the way to go. But if you have a dog who's not food motivated or you just can't find something that's going to get your dog's attention outside, you can use a toy. You can bring a toy outside, a squeaky toy or a rope toy or anything that your dog likes, a tennis ball that you can bounce. Um, but you want to select something that you're going to use as a reward for your dog outside. And what are you going to reward? Well, I suggest really working on eye contact outside, thinking about rewarding your dog every time your dog checks in with you. And at first, that might not be really like locking eyes to you fully, but even just like a quick glance back at you is something that you can reward. You don't have to use a clicker to mark that exact moment that the dog turns and looks at you, but I do suggest using a clicker, especially outside. Uh, I think the noise of that, you know, that sort of sharp, very distinct noise can help focus your dog. Uh, but you can also use a word if it's just too much to handle using a clicker outside, like use the word yes to mark the moment that your dog looks at you and then follow that up with your treat, whether it's a food reward or a quick game of tug. Of course, playing a quick game of tug outside is uh, <laughs> more time consuming and complicated, which is again why I say I probably suggest you try using like little bits of hot dog or uh, a licky treat first but do what you need to do now if you were to reward nothing else except your dog checking in with you every time your dog checks in with you at first I would do every time rather than just some of the time um, you're gonna get a dog who's walking right near you on a loose leash because I also want you to think about where you're giving that food reward I want you to be giving it where you want your dog to be walking and in this case that's right next to you so there's sort of like a magic spot that is like near your knee for most dogs or near your ankle depending on how how uh, tall your dog is it might be up near your hip but think about where your where your dog's head should be while you're walking where would you like your dog's head to be and that's where you're going to give that treat literally like touching your leg in that spot. And sometimes when I'm working with clients, I'll even put a piece of tape in that spot just as a reminder of this is where they're this is where we're rewarding. There's a saying that dog trainers say sometimes you you click for the behavior, you treat for position. Now the fact is the the treat and the position is actually really more important, I think, than whatever it is that you're clicking for. And if feel if it feels too complicated to click every time or reward every time your 
dog checks back at you, you could start by just giving a treat in that magic spot by your leg every three steps. Or sometimes I'll suggest picking a marker on the street, like every bumper of every car that you see, or every third crack in the pavement. Pick something that you're going to see, you know, at least 10 times in a block. And every time you reach that thing, reward your dog at your knee. No matter what your dog is doing, I don't even care if your dog is pulling at the end of the leash, although that shouldn't be happening because you should be rewarding your dog at such a a high rate. And like I said, you should be walking fast, switching directions. Your dog is going to be very focused on you because he's going to be like, man, oh man, my human has suddenly become this magic cheese dispenser. And gosh, there's this one spot on her leg that is particularly interesting to me right now. And that's something I would like to focus on. And if your dog is focusing on that, that spot on your, on your calf or whatever, wherever it is, um, that's a dog who's going to be walking quite close to you and walking really nicely. Now, I'm not suggesting that you lure your dog with the treats that you're using. Uh, I want them to be out of sight most of the time. I want them to be in your treat pouch, and I want them to appear uh, in that area, that magic area, that magic zone that we're talking about. Um, rather than, you know, having the treat in front of your dog's face the whole time. I want your dog to think about what do I need to do in order to make that treat appear, rather than having your dog just be like, there's food, I'm following the food, I'm following the food. But like I said, in the very beginning while you're working on this, like I said, you can you can reward for eye contact, whether or not you've asked for it, just anytime your dog checks back at you. But even sort of a, an, an easier step than that uh, is rewarding your dog no matter what, just in that one position. And this is a really great thing to practice in a hallway without your dog on leash. You can practice leash walking without your dog on the leash and then just add the leash into the equation. Again, it should be really lightweight, lightweight and loose. Your dog should hardly feel it at all. Um, so it shouldn't be a huge uh, leap to go from pract- practicing this in the hallway without a leash to practicing it in the hallway with a leash. Um, what you're going to do is just walk up and down the hallway and every three steps or every time you get to a neighbor's door or whatever, um, you're going to give that tree in the magic zone Uh, on your leg. Really like so many other things having to do with training, the idea is to start out with your criteria being nothing. When you're practicing in the hallway this way, whether or not your dog is on a leash while you practice, you're just teaching your dog that all of this great stuff happens in that magic spot, that magic zone, and you're going to achieve the behavior that you want, which is your dog walking right next to you, uh, without specifically reinforcing that behavior. You're just building the dog's association that, gosh, you know, really great stuff always happens in that one area by my person's leg. Now, that doesn't mean you can't also reward good behaviors, good walking behaviors. And that's why I was suggesting picking some kind of marker uh, when you are outside or even in your hallway. Let's say every time you get to the neighbor's door, if that leash has a bend in it, or if your dog is checking in with you, click and treat always in that magic zone, putting the treat in that magic zone. More than anything else, when you're working on loose leash walking, you're not focusing on the leash and you're not really focusing on the steps your dog's taking either as much as what you're focusing on is getting and keeping your dog's attention. And, you know, when I mentioned that what you're not really doing is luring, the treat should should appear, it shouldn't be out all the time. Um, that's true, but there is kind of one exception, which is if you're passing something that you're pretty sure is going to distract your dog, whether that be another dog um, or, I don't know, a posse of squirrels or whatever it is, then you might choose... Um, to give a treat kind of consistently, whether like rapid fire, again, in that magic zone by your knee, or if you're giving something like peanut butter in a liquid treat dispenser, um, just giving it to your dog while you're walking past that other dog consistently, like letting them lick it the whole time. What you're doing is keeping their focus on you and making your reward extra, extra good because, you know, it just keeps coming. And that's going to help your dog build the association of, you know, when I see another dog or when I see 
God, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is that that doorman who is always trying to distract me or whatever, um, my human becomes extra exciting. And so it pays to put my attention um, by his or her leg. Again, always rewarding uh, in that spot right near your your knee or whatever, wherever it is, depending on how tall your dog is. Um, there are a couple exercises that you can practice um, when you are not outside that might help your leash walking, like I mentioned practicing in the hallway. Another exercise that I like to have people practice is teaching their dog uh, a place that you want them to stand, which ultimately can translate into a place where you want them to walk. Now, a lot of people say, you know, I want my dog to heal, and they'll say, heal, heal. Um, but what does that really mean? I think what it means is there's a very specific kind of rectangular area or circular area, a zone, uh, on one of your sides where you want your dog to basically station. Well, you can teach your dog to station in that place by simply shaping them to do that when you are standing next to that station. Um, I've talked about shaping in previous episodes. I believe I have a whole episode just on shaping. A really good exercise is always starting out with like a yoga mat, teaching a dog to go to a yoga mat. What I like about like an inexpensive yoga mat is you can cut the yoga mat down to smaller and smaller sizes to the point of like teaching your dog to go to something the size of a post-it, a yoga mat post-it, which is useful for so many reasons. Um, This certainly being one of them. You can have like a, you know, like a piece of printer paper size uh, cut up piece of yoga mat and teach your dog that when you are standing next to it, you want your dog to be standing on that mat. And then you can work up to walking with your dog in that position as well. Um, I have some clients who use a cue for this. They call the cue heel. You can also teach your dog uh, to target something on your leg with uh, your dog's nose or even a little bit more advanced teaching shoulder targeting. If you can teach your dog uh, to on cue touch his or her shoulder to your leg, then that too is a really great heel position. Another exercise that I think is a nice one to work on, uh, sometimes called silky leash, um, and I'll link to some examples of silky leash on uh, in the show notes. But essentially what you're doing is teaching your dog directionality, uh, kind of like horses are taught Um, I believe, I've never done any horse training, but I think uh, a horse is taught when they feel pressure on their right side, they need to move right. When they feel pressure on their left side, they need to move left. You can do this with a dog and a leash as well. Uh, Basically, you're going to stand, uh, I've usually done this starting by standing in front of a dog um, with a leash taut, and you very gently start pulling in one direction on the right or the left and you click and treat as soon as your dog goes in that direction at all again you're teaching when i feel pressure uh, on one side that's the side i go to or i guess go to the other side <laughs> whatever um you know i mentioned um one nice thing about the freedom harness is is that it connects in two places um one thing I like using the freedom harness for is this silky leash style training because it's all the more places where your dog is going to feel that pressure. And if you ultimately then switch to just using a harness or just using, I'm sorry, if you just start using a front clip or a back clip harness or whatever, um, your dog is going to have the experience of uh, learning that pressure in either one of those areas indicates which way you want your dog to turn. And this can be really useful because it's just all the more information we're giving our dogs about um, how we want them to walk and where we want them to walk. Something else that I I have found that I do with my dog is um, I'll make a little sound when we're changing direction. Uh, And I never specifically set out to teach this. I just kind of started doing it and he started to Uh, catch on that when he hears that little noise um, he needs to pay attention to some sort of change in route and you know think about what other clues and cues you can give your dog to help him or her 
on his walk. Um, Another great habit to get into is teaching your dog on walks is to stop at a curb. Now, if you have a really solid sit cue, you could cue your dog to sit when you get to the curb, but you don't even need to get your dog into a sit. Really what you want your dog to understand is that they need to stop at the curb. And if you stop and then give your dog a treat at every curb and you just get into that habit, you know, that alone is going to start teaching your dog, you know, gosh, we got to the curb. I know there's going to be a treat here before we start moving. Now, are you always going to have to give a treat? No, but you want to do it enough times that your dog starts to think that it's a good idea to wait for that treat when he or she gets to the curb. Again, you could also cue a sit, and then certainly you can uh, reward the sit. But you're going to find that the curb itself becomes a cue for your dog to stop. And when you start walking again, um, whenever I'm practicing any kind of stopping or sitting on a walk, not only will I give a food reward or, you know, if I'm using um, like a tug toy to reward a dog or whatever, not only will I give those things, but I'll also start walking really fast and sort of make the return to walking extra exciting. You know, you're working with movement when you're working on walking and movement Um, I think for most dogs is very exciting so use that to your advantage. Now of course as I'm saying that I'm thinking about all the clients I've worked with through the years who have dogs who have the opposite problem where they're not motivated by movement they do not want to walk and uh, to some extent you know I think we have bred certain breeds of dogs for sure to not be great walkers and you know you can't have an English bulldog and expect to run marathons with him um, of course you do want to motivate them to walk to some extent you can keep those walks short however um, I think teaching targeting whether it's teaching a dog to target your hand by your leg or to t- target like um a piece of tape on your leg can be, both of those uh, methods can be good ways to uh, motivate a dog to walk or teaching your dog to touch a target stick um, which you know you can get an official dog target stick we even have like clicker sticks that you can use out of a clicker stick clicker at the end but you know a spatula a wooden spoon um a fly swatter, anything that you can kind of hold out in front of your dog. Again, it's not luring the dog with food, but anything that you can hold out in front of the dog to get the dog to move forward, use that. And then in those cases, you might choose to toss the tree out in front of you. I would use something that uh, will be easily spottable when you toss it. Generally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of tossing uh, treats onto the ground when I'm working uh, with dogs outside just because I don't want them to get into the habit of picking things up off the ground. But if uh, you're if you have a dog who really won't budge, that can be a way to get a couple extra feet uh, in front of you, you know, sort of alternate, have them touch the, the target stick and then toss a treat and now you've gotten, you know, eight feet perhaps. Another option which can keep you from having to toss the treats on the ground can be to get um, a long spoon and um, put some peanut butter at the end of the spoon and reward your dog out in front of you uh, with that bit of peanut butter. Again, I would first have the dog target something that doesn't that isn't smeared with something delicious and then reward them with the yummy thing. I think um, this will help you eventually not have to be a peanut butter dispenser when you're outside as opposed to giving peanut butter as a lure. Um, But uh, delivering peanut butter in that kind of way can also help you motivate a dog to move uh, when your dog doesn't want to move. So again, you're going to have them touch the target stick or target your leg or whatever and then uh, eat some peanut butter out in front of you and repeat. But, you know, sometimes if you have a dog who is not enthusiastic about walking, who uh, plants, as as we say, um, you know, sometimes I find if I have time, a good solution for that is that I just stop too. Rather than cajoling, cajoling the dog or starting to do some training, um, both both those things might actually reinforce the behavior of stopping and not moving. You know, you're better off working to um, 
get a dog to walk before the dog stops because once the dog stops almost anything you do is going to reinforce them having stopped um sometimes what I'll do is I'll just stop too you know obviously I don't always have time to do this uh sometimes you do have to get somewhere with a dog in that case um if it's a smaller dog I'll often just pick the dog up clearly they're sending a message they don't want to walk um message received But if I have time, you know, it is, it's the dog's walk. And if that's what the dog wants to spend the walk doing, okay, so be it. I'm going to stop too and just stand there and be really boring. And what I find is eventually dogs grow bored of this game and realize that, um, it's actually not that rewarding to stop, especially if most of your walks are rich with reinforcers. If you are spending your walks, um, you know, rewarding your dog in that magical spot by your leg and uh, reinforcing any moment that you notice your dog checks in with you, that's a loose leash, et cetera, et cetera. Just uh, being a statue in the street is going to uh, be not as interesting as the other things that happen during your walk. So I hope you take some of these tips. I hope they work out for you. Um, Let me know how it goes you can get in touch on Instagram. We are there at School for the Dogs. Um, And if you have a question about walking or about anything at all, feel free to ask me. Next week, I believe I am going to do a QA and a episode, so I'm still um, sifting through questions. Would love to get yours. You can ask a question at anniegrossman.com slash ask. Fun fact of the day, uh, in New York City, I only just recently learned this, dog leashes actually have to be six feet long. Um, I don't know if they're allowed to be shorter than that, but they can't be any longer than that. So especially if uh, you see people using big retractable leashes and their dogs are way out in front of them, uh, you know, you might want to remind them of that. You know, the reason I don't like retractable leashes, um, I have a couple of reasons why I don't love them for walking in the city. There are other situations where I think they're fine, but walking in the city, I think, you know, you like I was saying before about what I like about having a, a waist leash is you want your dog to learn the radius that is allowable. And if you have a um, retractable leash, that radius is constantly changing. Another thing about retractable leashes is that um, they're always taught. Your dog is always is feeling that taut feeling unless you lock the leash and let your dog um go out uh you know take like have it have it be slack but most people don't use retractable leashes in that way um you know another problem with retractable leashes is that um if you drop it it can snap towards your dog which can be very scary to a dog having this big plastic thing um zooming towards them but um actually the main reason why I'm not a fan of retractable leashes is I don't like having a regular leash in my hand like I said I like having my hands as free as possible and having a big hunk of plastic in my hand um just just messes me up and make and it makes it harder for me to deliver treats um our woof shout out today goes to longtime school for the dogs uh, student Hazelnut. Hazelnut is, um, I think she's a mutt. She probably has some pit bull in her, maybe, maybe even some, gosh, I don't know, Basenji or Rhodesian Ridgeback. She's, she's a little low to the ground though. Um, anyway, this from her trainer, Reese, who works with her during our day school program. Reese writes to me, Hazelnut has made loads of progress. She's the unlikely best dog for settling in the morning and leagues better at engaging, just disengaging from polite play thanks to helper dogs and her excellent recall. Hazelnut has also done much better recently with not reacting to dogs and skateboards and loud spooky things when I take her out for walks. She checks in often and will maintain eye contact or really getting into some fun targeting when we avoid triggers targeting being what we were talking about um, earlier in this episode. She's also trimmed down a bit. I like to think it's because when she comes to day school, we usually run up the block back to school after she potties. She loves to run, even though she's tiny. I have to run hard so we keep pace. Anyway, Hazelnut, we love you. Thanks for being such a good pupil. And i um, really glad that you and uh, the wonderful Reese have such a great relationship. Thanks so much for listening. You can support School for the Dogs podcast by telling your friends about it, leaving a review, or shopping in our online store. You can learn more about us 
and sign up to get lots of free training resources when you visit us online at schoolforthedogs.com.